Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everything Iconic with me, Danny Pellegrino. I'm so excited. I have writer, actress, producer, activist, Jen Richards here. Jen, how are you doing? I'm excellent. How are you, Danny? I'm super excited to talk to you. Although I do, I, I am a little bit upset because I loved the show Mrs. Fletcher, and I'm devastated that we're not getting more episodes. I want. More. I would have loved a second season as well. That was such a fun show. It was such a fun cast. I just love working with Catherine. Uh, Catherine it's been Hahn, so wonderful. Who's to, ha- yes, who's now it's having this crazy moment? Such a moment! It's such a moment. And what I one of the many, many, many things I love about Catherine is that she has never been on social media, so she really doesn't know just how beloved she is. Like when these like memes started happening, I would be like sending them to her. Like, have you seen this? Have you seen this? <laughs> like she hadn't seen any of it. She's just living her best life. She's she's really she, great. I mean, if anyone out there listening hasn't seen Mrs. Fletcher, it was just this one season, a beautiful season. And- and, and yeah, I, I like I wanted so so many more episodes, but you were great in it, and Thank I loved you. it. Now, Jen, you're also starring on an upcoming uh, arc on the CBS's Clarice, which we're going to get to. Uh, before I do, though, I want to know what are you watching on TV? What do you like? Do you watch a lot of TV? I don't. Uh, and over the last year, when I do watch television, I tend to just rewatch the same sitcoms I've seen a million times before. God, like what? I'll watch oh, like Brooklyn Nine-Nine and The Good Place and Parks and Rec and One Day at a Time and uh, anything that's kind. Right. It's basically I, all I can handle these days is just kind television. <laughs> you and me both. My boyfriend and I have been watching The Golden Girls before bed lately. Oh. And it just... I don't know. It's everything's so heavy in the world. It's nice to just kind of go to bed with the girls. I like that. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I will say I recently watched um, Dead to Me. The, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was really fun. Like, that Christina was really cool. Like, oh, my God. The performances of both the leads is just so, it's so good and really smartly written. Um, it's such a really, it's a very realistic female friendship, uh, as fraught as it was. Uh, so that that was really fun. Uh, and yeah. I, I did enjoy that. And my favorite television show of the year is Veneno. Like, easily, by and far, some of the best, like, the best trans portrayal I've ever seen, like, without even a close second, and just one of the best TV shows I've ever seen. So that was very exciting. Fantastic. Yes, everyone should be watching that. And speaking of trans representation, uh, you had a, you were a part of a documentary on Netflix called Disclosure, which I thought was brilliant and fantastic. And there's a specific clip that really even went viral uh, of you specifically speaking about trans representation. Uh, On Friday night, I was watching the Oprah interview with Elliot Page, and it was interesting to me. Oprah had said that Elliot recommended before they do do the interview that Oprah watches Disclosure because it's truly must watch. Uh, It's it's so eye-opening in so many ways. And forgive me if I'm wrong, but did you film that in 2019? You know, I actually filmed twice for that documentary. Uh, at, well, technically three times uh, when Sam was first developing the idea like five years ago and he was doing a, a, f- a first round of research interviews. And then I sat once for him and then sat again for him near the end of the process. It, it, it happened over many years. So I think it probably, the last interview was probably in 18 or 19. I I do remember that Pose had just come out. And for us, that was like this big game changer. Like we'd never seen ourselves on network television in that way. Uh, so the conversation was shifting even as we were recording Disclosure. Yeah, I was curious. I, I know it hasn't been a long period of time, but I wondered if you noticed a change in trans representation, even since you sat down to talk about it for that amazing documentary. I have, and Disclosure had an immediate and irrevocable impact on uh, the industry itself. Like, in a really, I, I'm kind of astonished by how quickly and how deeply it it, it took root. Uh, I remember, actually, in fact, it was it was with CBS who did Clarice. I was having a general with their their casting folks. I think there was seven of them from all over the country. You know, it was on Zoom. And typically when I have generals, I often spend a pretty big chunk of it doing some kind of basic trans education uh, and trans representation, just kind of giving the executives or casting folks or producers, whoever it is, a kind of sense of where we've been, you know, what needs to be addressed, like how we can do it better before we even get to like my, my personal stuff. And I've just kind of taken that on as um, 
I wouldn't say burden, it's a responsibility. It's something I feel up to doing and I, I have the privilege to do. So I take those opportunities. And I, I sat down for this for this general with the CBS casting folks. And I was all ready to say these things. They're like, all of them, all seven of them are like, we've seen disclosure. We loved it. We get it. We want to do better. So, you know, kind of rather than like doing all this work to get up to kind of on the same page, like Disclosure's now done that work. Like people have seen that movie. Uh, it's it's intellectually challenged them and made them aware of new uh, perspectives. And it's emotionally affected them in ways where they feel both complicit and, you know, um, a kind of moral imperative to do better. Uh, the impact of that movie cannot be overstated. And we will see the results Results of that impact for a, a generation. Uh, it's really, really incredible. Culminating, yes, with with like Oprah watched it. <laughs> like, uh, Oprah watched it, and like I think she brings it up like five or six times uh, during the interview. Uh, it's it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Everyone should watch it. It's it's on Netflix, and uh, it's entertaining. It's moving. It's informative. It's a really great documentary. I'm so proud of Sam who created the film and everyone involved. It's so important. And I'm a nostalgia junkie too. So it's interesting to go back and look at some of the things that I watched yeah. even as a kid uh, through that lens and seeing, you know, just how far we've come and how not far we've come in other ways. It's, it was really eye opening. I, I think a lot about, I think a lot about Zeke's um, there's a moment in the documentary where he's talking about Ace Ventura and how, you know, the, the climactic moment of this like family friendly comedy is dozens and dozens of people violently vomiting at the sight of a trans woman who's just been stripped naked against her will, like in front of an audience. Like that was the climactic moment of a family comedy. And mm -hmm. Zeke talks about that's like his, that was his favorite movie growing up as a kid. And like, that's how it ended. And, and the way that he internalized that disgust, um, Crying Game did very similar for me. Uh, having grown up with that and then, you know, dating men and then like that image just kind of like always plays in your mind. Right. Uh, and Silence of the Lambs is another big one. Mm -hmm. uh, just the way that those images of trans people as monstrous, as objects of um, disgust uh, filter out into the culture and then more, more pointedly get internalized by trans people themselves. There's a moment that I, I relate to in a way, uh, I, my brothers and I, I have two straight older brothers, and we used to watch the show Entourage. And I remember there was an episode where one of the characters on that was getting a massage and the massage therapist thought that, uh, or the lead character thought that the massage therapist was hitting on him. And then he he got very violent and he, he got in a fight with someone. And I, I remember feeling that I was closeted at the time. And I remember just feeling that. And that image sticks out in my head of feeling like, oh, I mm -hmm. can never come out because... Uh, I equated that if a straight person found out I was gay with violence and I, yes. and that, that resonated with me in disclosure so much because I had never thought of it from the trans perspective, but uh, yeah, I think you don't even realize disclosure's that. Disclosure is a good media education, not just for trans people, but it makes you aware of how we look at any marginalized person on screen, you know, whether they're, you know, disabled or an immigrant or, um, you know, deaf or blind or gay or black, whatever it is, like, like it, after you see disclosure, you kind of have to ask yourself, like, who wrote that? Like, who directed it? Who participated in it? What does it say about a marginalized person? Like, what kinds of narratives am, am I internalizing because of that depiction? And you say in it, you say we need more trans representation because then the occasional clumsy representation wouldn't matter that much. Now, it, one of the things that struck out, and I talked to Brian Michael Smith, who was on the show a couple months ago uh, from 911, uh, Lone Star 911. Or Brian was actually my roommate in Los Angeles. Oh my God. We, him and I went to the same college. We like had oh, no kidding. in Kent State University. Yeah, uh, I, love I love him. Yeah. But uh, I was wondering the pressure for you when you take part in a project, you mention it not being a burden, but are there moments when you're going into a meeting and you, or you leave a meeting and you have to explain this, or even in an interview, I mean, we're talking about trans uh, representation. Mm -hmm. Do you ever leave feeling exhausted or, or drained that you're constantly having to do the teaching? Does that make sense? It does. And I know exactly what you mean. And weirdly, no, uh, I consider it a, a privilege. The, when I came out in Chicago about, about 10 years ago, the very first 
um, public event I went to as a trans person, like in the trans community, uh, was a wake for a young black trans woman who had been murdered and was the third trans woman who had been murdered uh, that year in Chicago. Um, no one was ever caught or arrested. There was absolutely no justice. And, and right from, from that beginning, right from that entree, uh, I was, you know, mentored, I was helped, I, I learned from mostly um, poor trans women of color, uh, who were the ones who are often doing all of the work on the ground in terms of community advocacy and, and mutual aid. And I quickly realized right from the beginning that I was always going to have a certain additional amount of privilege uh, because I was white, um, because of my background and the experiences I'd had, uh, and that I had a responsibility to use that privilege to help people with less. Um, and since all that help had been given to me, every time I get to help other people in some way, shape, or form, some way, shape, or form, even if it's just through a conversation and, and simple education, uh, then to me, it's like, I've, I, I, I feel a privilege that I get to give back in that way, that I get to help in some small, in some small way. Like I'm not on the ground doing community organizing. I'm not there at the, you know, LGBT centers or out on the streets with these kids. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, like Chase Strangio um, in state houses around the country right now, having to argue against bigots just so that trans kids, you know, can play sports without being, um, you know, legalized out of existence. So I, I'm incredibly lucky. So anytime I get, I get to give a little bit back and like help in some, in some small way, uh, it's a blessing. So it's amazing. Jen, thank you. Uh, I want to talk about Clarice. Now, Clarice is a show on CBS. It's sort of a continuation of the story that we all saw play out in the film Silence of the Lambs. I wonder if you could maybe just briefly explain to people uh, about the sort of legacy of this Buffalo Bill character from the original film. It's a complicated legacy uh, it, for several reasons, in part because Science of the Lambs is such an excellent movie. If it were a bad movie, it'd be very easy to dismiss the fact that the main villain is is framed as this kind of psychotic, transsexual, you know, serial killer. It'd be very easy to, to dismiss that if it wasn't such an excellent movie <laughs> and, and such an award-winning, iconic movie that's been a touchstone for, for 30 years now. Uh, but what it did and what many people aren't really consciously aware of is that in a time when very little was known about trans people in the public consciousness, where, where almost no one knew an actual trans person, it became the dominant image of trans people was um, this psychopathic serial killer who, who so desperately wanted to embody femininity that he was willing to murder and skin uh, actual women. Uh, and that kind of framing of trans people, particularly as it built on a legacy that goes back to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and continues through, you know, Dress to Kill, and Sleepaway Camps and countless other movies that showed um you know, a man who wants to dress up as a woman as a as a stand in for a, for for a psychotic individual. And so it created this 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 legacy and this touchstone. And, and for me, it manifested in a very personal and direct way when I was was on the edge of, of coming out as trans myself and transitioning. And in my, my previous career, I started kind of towing the water a little bit and asking my colleagues, like how they would feel about that. Like, would I still have my job essentially? And I, I told one colleague that I was thinking of transitioning and she looked at me quizzically and said, do you mean like Buffalo Bill? Like it was her only touchstone for what a trans person was. Uh, and that's not exactly the reference you want in people's minds when you're coming out as trans. Uh, so it, cr it created a really complicated legacy. And like I said earlier, um, it also, a lot of trans people internalize that kind of imagery because we don't have anything else. When there's no positive representation, you you kind of glom onto whatever is there. And when all that's there is, is horrendous, either a person committing violence or as you said earlier, being a victim of violence, you start to think in that, in that kind of binary, like, am I... Um, am I crazy? <laughs> am I deranged? Like, am I uh, mentally ill or, or am I going to be a victim? Again, those are the only two ways that you can embody transness based on, on media. And that's, um, that's a hard one to overcome. And I was really thrilled to help be part of something that might combat that legacy a little bit. So when you first got the call about coming on board or having a meeting about coming on board, did you wrestle with that decision at all? Or did you feel, oh, this is an exciting opportunity for me to 
try to maybe write this wrong a little bit? Definitely the latter. And in part because I was such a fan of the movie and of the character of Clarice Starling, uh, you know, that there's, there's a dearth of positive trans representation, but there's also just a dearth of positive female representation, you know, growing up. So in the nineties, just to see this really, you know, smart, ambitious woman who, I, yeah, I always think about that image uh, of her in the elevator in the movie, like surrounded by all these men who are like, you know, two feet taller than her. And yet she triumphs um, through her intelligence and tenacity. Uh, she uses her femininity in ways, it's, it was a powerful character. And then, you know, having it been played by this very important, you know, queer actress as well, uh, I, I was very excited. And then I first got approached about the about this show uh, by Nick Adams at Glad, and knowing that he was involved in any way uh, gave me a lot of trust. And he trusted Alex and Jenny and Elizabeth, the showrunners of Clarice. He had worked with them previously, particularly with Star Trek, who had been doing some really groundbreaking work in terms of sexuality and gender and the genre space. So all the pieces were there for me to have uh, to have a good amount of faith that this was going to be uh, handled in the best possible way. I got a chance to see your episode and I wondered, have you watched it yet? Uh, your I first did episode? just a few days ago for the and first what, time. So yeah. how did you think about how it was handled after you, after seeing it uh, in finished uh, form? You know, I'm one of those actors who doesn't really like to watch themselves. And I, I was, I, I probably, if I didn't have to do talk about it in the press, I'm not sure I would have watched it at all. Uh, but my wife is my biggest fan. So she insisted <laughs> we watch it. Uh, and I was actually very happy with how it turned out. You were so good, it's Jen. really well handled. Uh, it's a great script. Eleanor Jean, who's a trans writer, who actually was a writer on Mrs. Fletcher. So had uh, we had worked together previously. Uh, I thought she wrote a really powerful script. Um, there's a... Um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that there is a really wonderful moment, a kind of monologue where my character confronts Clarice about uh, the, the the legacy of Buffalo Bill and her kind of complicity and press that linked trans people to uh, murderers. And uh, that was a really high bar for Eleanor to clear, to, to have a character do this speech, which on the one hand, had to embody the entire uh, history of criticism of Signs of Lambs, had to speak for the entire trans community uh, to the complicated legacy, but also had to be believable in terms of this one character confronting another character, like a real person confronting another real person about the personal damage that that, that story had done to her. And I think Eleanor did it uh, really, really beautifully. And then Deborah, our director, uh, really went to great lengths to make sure that I was in a place when we recorded that scene where I could be very personal with it and I could infuse it with some of my own um, my, my own trauma, <laughs> for lack of a better word, and really bring some authenticity to it. So it was a kind of perfect storm of, of really uh, great women from Elizabeth, the, the head writer, to Eleanor, the writer of that episode, to Deborah, uh, to Rebecca, my co-star, and... Uh, and I did a good job myself too. So I did you were amazing, part. Jen. You were amazing. <laughs> and also, I think it's a really great thing because I, I don't know, maybe it's wrong of me to think this way, but CBS, I often think of being sort of one way. And so I think this is going to present yeah. uh, this storyline to an audience that maybe wouldn't see it otherwise. And I, I think that's a really special thing. Frankly, that's what excites me most about Clarice overall is the way that it has centered women and the way that it has, you know, named victims in a way that we don't often see on, on CBS procedurals. That's talked specifically ab about violence against marginalized and vulnerable women. I love the way that they've made a storyline out of um, Clarice and Ardelia's friendship and the way that Clarice can advance because she's white, where Ardelia is punished because she's black. Like they're taking all these kind of like complicated issues that were this, that 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 were the subtext of Signs of the Lambs and have you know been brought forward into the kind of popular consciousness now and are like finding those little tension points and making really rich stories out of them. It's a it's a really good show. Uh, this might sound like a, a silly or stupid question, but is there something that you've seen recently, <clears throat> excuse me, that maybe hasn't handled uh, trans issues well at all, or that you think, oh man, they is that a crazy question? Uh, Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, Jen, I was going to ask you because I people wrote in, they wanted me to ask you what you think of the Caitlyn Jenner of it all uh, about oh, running for Lord. office. I just, I, I don't even know what to say. It just seems, it's a distraction more than anything. She, uh, 
it, it's hard for me to believe that she's even doing this in good faith. I don't think she has any chance uh, of winning. So I'm not sure what she's really doing this for. Um, and the little time that I spent with her, I have no sense that, that she's, um, uh, particularly politically conscious. Uh, I don't think she's done a really good job of examining the kind of privilege that she can that that she can take for granted because of her social position, or even specifically the the impact that all these laws are actually having uh, on trans youth. I will say that she's a very kind and empathetic person. Uh, she she does actually care. Uh, she does care about injustice, but she tends to notice it only on an individual level and not a systemic level. I'm not sure that she really has the, the capacity to think um, in terms of injustice at the systemic level uh, and certainly doesn't hasn't indicated uh, any desire to um, to critique or challenge a system that that benefits hers that benefits her and, and hurts people who who have less. So it's a it's really frustrating when the media uh, elevates her or thinks that in any way that she speaks for trans people because she she doesn't she she speaks for herself. Um, so it, it was really hurtful to see someone who should be able to speak on the issue of trans people in sports quite pointedly uh, and with real empathy and compassion and to see her instead side, you know, uh, with bigots and misinformation uh, and know that it's going to hurt actual trans kids was, was disappointing and enraging. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's a few uh, trans teens that I know listen to this show, specifically one who reached out uh, and uh, wanted to basically ask, uh, she lives in a small town and is terrified, uh, confused. Is there any advice you would give to a young trans teen who is struggling with coming out and coming to terms? Yeah, a lot, actually. Um, although, although the world is so different than when I came out, I, I think with social media, it must be so much harder in some ways, but it's also probably much easier to find resources and community. Um, find your people is probably the best advice I can ever give any young queer person. There are other people out there like you, and finding them will become a, a, a tremendous uh, source of, of support and camaraderie and friendship. Um, know that you're not just one thing, that uh, just because you're trans doesn't mean you're only trans. So continue to develop your interests and your hobbies and your passions. Something I often tell young trans people is pick something you love and become great at it. Because if you're great at one thing, it will give you confidence in other areas of your life. It will give something to talk about. It will give people a reason to engage with you and respect you that is outside of this one aspect of your identity. You know, not to hide or reduce that aspect of yourself, but just let it be one part of you, one of many parts of yourself. Um, yeah, and be kind to yourself. <laughs> It's it's tough, um, and you know we we often say in the trans community that that things don't actually get better for us. Uh, life actually gets um, quite a bit harder when you come out as trans, but it also gets um, you get stronger through the process. You get much stronger. You can handle more than you ever could have imagined yourself handling, uh, and in that struggle, you find something really beautiful. Uh, and a source of, of strength and pride that will um, carry you through the rest of your life. Jen, I know I have to wrap this up, but I just want to thank you. You're, I, I could talk to you forever. I, I've always been such a fan of your work and your acting work. Are there any acting goals that you have or, or writing goals, producing goals? Like what's next for you? I, I'm doing a lot of writing right now. I have um, three TV shows in development. I mean, two that I created and one that I'm writing on a, a big genre piece. Uh, I don't think any of them will be announced anytime soon. Creating TV is a long, slow process, uh, but there's a lot of really great stuff coming down the road that I'm excited about. Uh, I don't have any other acting jobs lined up, but if any casting folks or directors are listening to this, please, please have me over. I love doing that. Uh, I would love to do a comedy and I would love to play a villain. I think those are the two areas where we really uh, 
need some room for growth. Uh, trans people don't always have to be so serious. Uh, being trans can actually be really funny. I love what folks like um, Shakina Nafak and Patty Harrison are doing out there for trans people in comedy, but uh, I think it's time for like an indie feature or a sitcom or something that includes trans people uh, and playing a villain. Uh, I think that's that's a next big frontier. We're still kind of in this, you know, what I call a Sydney Poitier moment where trans people have to be, you know, so classy and dignified and respectable and good looking and intelligent and advocates like all of that. Like uh, I would like to see some messy trans people out there and some evil trans people out there. And I'm happy to play either. <laughs> I love that. And now uh, just to wrap up, I ask all of my guests this question, their favorite Mariah Carey song. Oh gosh. I, I'm not a <laughs> pop music person. I don't know pop music. Uh I don't think I can name a... I know she has a Christmas song. <laughs> we'll say that, Jen. That works for me. Uh, that works for me. It's a classic. Uh, Jen, I want to encourage all of our listeners, uh, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, to like, subscribe, comment, all of that stuff. And then also check out Jen on Clarice on CBS. Uh, it, you're fantastic in it. And I think it's going to really touch a lot of people who who may not be touched by by these kinds of things uh, in, in media. So thank, thank you so you, much Jen. for the conversation, Danny. Oh, it was such an honor and a pleasure. Thank you.